Welcome. I'm Dr. Michael Pierce. This is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about QEEG, or quantitative electroencephalography. That is the process of taking pictures of the brain's waves. This is not exactly photographs um, where we're taking images of the anatomy. We're not seeing the actual tissue of the brain like in an MRI or, an, or a um, CT scan, these kinds of things that show shadows of, of actual anatomy. Our interest is not in taking a picture of the anatomy to see if a chunk is missing or damaged. We're looking more at function. So these are functional images. These are um, images that are designed to see how does the brain fire? Does it fire too much or too little amplitude or power or voltage? Does it fire um, too much connectivity or too little connectivity, which is to say the, the noise between regions, whereas in one region of the brain communicates with another region of the brain. Sometimes there's too much crosstalk, very much like in a noisy classroom full of students. Um, you can imagine it's like students that are talking to each other too much would be um, increased coherence or, um, or, in, or decreased coherence, not enough, not enough crosstalk. So, I'd like to kind of begin by saying that um, EEG was discovered, gosh, between 1850 and 1930. There was a lot of experimentation going on, and they began to track waves by putting little electrodes on people's head and putting screws into their scalp to measure the um, electrical waves that were coming out of the brain. Because we all emit brain waves, and they come out very weakly from our skull, and they, they emit from our brain, and they, dis they dissipate very quickly as they come out. They don't go very far, and they're not very powerful. But we can pick them up with simple, simple electrodes, and we can also pick them up with high-tech expensive electrodes made of silver chloride or gold or other types of metals. Um, but most of the time we just use tin and we can pick up these, um, these brain waves. Now the first brain waves were picked up with just a couple of electrodes placed around the head. And, um, and today we use a, we use a full cap. We use a, a, like a swim cap that has all of these different electrodes placed at a certain spot. And, um, and they're sized for different people's heads. This, um, this convention of sizing, um, sizing the caps is consistent so that a patient will get the same types of readings over and over and over again. There's, there's a lot of intra and inter-examiner reliability when we take QEG readings and when we take these caps and put them on people's heads. Um, in fact, the, um, the electrode placement really only needs to be uh, within an inch radius of the actual point um, to be accurate. So it's really quite a lot of sloppiness is permitted and allowed uh, because we can, we can triangulate and pick up a lot of what goes on when, when we use, you know, 19 or more channels on top of the head. So um, in the old days, the, QE, the EEG was simply a, um, a, a bunch of tracings, and we still use those tracings today. Each electrode provides a tracing that allows to see a line of the brain waves, and um, those brain waves are recorded. And, um, and then uh, as, as technology got better and better, we, we began to scientifically put those waves together into something called a QEEG, a quantitative electroencephalograph. Now, an EEG is still used today by neurologists in order to diagnose people with sleep disorders or epilepsies or other types of seizure disorders, um, they're used as a classical diagnosis process. Now, often the patient may be sleeping all night in a sleep laboratory, or they may not be sleeping. They may be um, hyperventilating with a doctor. Um, this can be dangerous in, in, in the cases of investigating for epilepsy or, or seizure disorder, because as the patient hyperventilates, they might go into a, a seizure and, and they could have the worst kind of seizure called status epilepticus, which is where they they just continue to seize and seize and seize and, and people can die. It doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. And so you need a crash card available and you need the ability to resuscitate and revive a person if you're going to do those kinds of, um, of EEGs. Now, now, the kinds that we do in most holistic offices are not those kinds. We're not having people hyperventilate. We're not doing tests to try to evoke uh, a seizure. Um, certainly, if a person has a suspected seizure disorder, we send them to a medical neurologist to have that done. Now, chiropractors, chiropractic neurologists, and psychologists uh, and some naturopaths frequently perform QEGs without um, an eye toward looking at pathology. Now, we're certainly trained to screen for pathology, but if, if, a, if a patient has any of the signs of a, of a seizure disorder, we don't do a QEG. We send them right off to a, a neurologist to investigate properly for a true um, seizure disorder or, or brain disorder. So make no mistake, there's the medical neurological EEG for um, 
um, for sleep disorders and for um, for um, seizure disorders, for um, epilepsy. And then there's this other world of QEG, which is somewhat more holistic, somewhat more designed to look at imbalances and not for pathology. And you'll see that emerging quite a lot as a big deal in medicine, where there's, there's the investigation for frank pathology, and there's an, the investigation for um, something that's functionally off, which is maybe not even qualifying as a pathology or a disease. And in many cases, insurance companies and governments will not pay for those, those problems. Now, the difficulty with that is that if they, don't, if they don't identify problems early, they can't prevent or head off or stop early or identify early these problems, which we can. And so financially and economically, we need to really evaluate this process. And the QEG is a great way of doing that. A QEG helps find and localize where on the brain, which lobes, you may have understood um, frontal lobe and parietal lobe and temporal lobe and occipital lobes of the brain. Those are the classic anatomical regions. And there's, of course, on each side of the hemispheres of the brain. So we're we're trying to take pictures and see what kind of area of the brain is dysfunctioning, what type of dysfunction is it? Is it is it um, is it amplitude and voltage, which is the power of the brain's uh, waves emitting, or is it um, connectivity, which is coherence or communication or crosstalk? Um, there's also which frequency is it? Is it the low frequency delta waves that are very slow and low frequencies like delta and theta waves? These waves are more related to healing and repair and, and rejuvenation and sleep. And then there's um, um, waves that go all the way up to the highest waves that we can detect right now, the gamma waves. And gamma waves have to do with very high frequency work where a person's really thinking hard, like, like um, imagine taking a final exam or, or testifying in court or doing something very stressful cognitively. So as we, as we look at the, you know, which brain wave is it, which area is it, what problem is it, is it voltage or is it amplitude or, or is it rather um, uh, coherence or, or, or crosstalk or noise or communication, excess communication between nodes or areas, that's how we use this to find imbalances. And then one of the big questions that's come up from a lot of people is how do we know what normal is? Well, the cool thing is there are lots and lots of reference databases that have been studied over the many decades since um, EEGs have been invented in the 1930s. So uh, we now know that we have things called Z-scores. A Z-score is a statistical measure of what is closer to average and what is farther away from average. So what we do is we take the patient and we compare them to thousands of normal people, their age and gender, and we plot them on a bell curve. And so a bell curve looks like this. And within, within a certain range of that bell curve is, falls most people that would be in the average or normal or pretty typical range. And at the extremes, we call them the long tails are the upper and lower ends of normal. For example, if we went to a store today and looked around at the people, there wouldn't be very many people that are eight feet tall. They would fall at the very high range. Most people would be in the five and six feet tall, and there would be very few people that are adults that are three or four feet tall. They would be down here at the low range. So likewise, brain waves are the same way. And so as we do these brain waves, measure these brain waves, we can make maps of them and we can look at them and we can figure out what is imbalanced in a person's brain compared to what we expect. Now, you may ask, what is the person doing during this test? Well, not much. They're supposed to sit quietly with their eyes closed and they're supposed to sit quietly with their eyes open. Now, I like to do 10 minutes of data collection each because that gives me time to um, dispose of artifact or blinks or chewing, uh, swallowing uh, artifacts, because the patient moves, they shift, and that's normal. They, they've got to shift around, they might move, they might swallow saliva. These are all normal activities. And so we want to have enough data so that we can cut off some of the, the, um, um, the artifacts, which are things that are not true brain waves. Likewise, when we're doing a QEG, um, one of the things that we can do now is the original EEGs were just waves, squiggly lines drawn by, you know, ink pens that were, that were um, you know, working on paper. And in fact, when I learned this the first time back in, in, in college, um, we actually had paper. And we would we'd roll out reams of paper and read what was recorded with the, the pens that would squiggle as, as the patient would get their, would get their, um, their EEG. Today it's on computers, and now because computers are faster, they can quantitate or, or make the Q part of QEG, and they can create pictures. Now, when this was first done a few decades ago, it was the surface of the brain. So uh, it measured a lot of the surface of the brain and the lobes that I talked about earlier, the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, etc. And um, 
that was really cool, very helpful, but it was all surface maps. And so now today we have the additional uh, power of computers that have these wonderful new uh, chips and, and speeds that they can simultaneously compute in real time what is happening in the brain, not just superficially and surface, but deep. They can measure inches deep and they can use um, a set of mathematics called the fast Fourier transformation, which is a set of instructions that are repeated over and over and over again to, um, to take a signal and to say, did that signal come from surface or from deep? Especially if you have enough electrodes. And since we have uh, at least 19 channels um, of, of electrodes that we're looking at, we can triangulate whether a signal comes from very deep in the brain uh, in an area called the limbic system, uh, the limbic cortex, the deep cortex, um, or the surface. And we can figure out where these areas came from. In fact, we can triangulate quite small now and get into resolution about five millimeters by five millimeters by five millimeter cubes. So that's the resolution size of an area of the brain. That's quite good. That's um, smaller than a lobe. It's smaller than a Broadman area. Now there's a, a thing called a Broadman area, which is a region of the brain, it's like real estate. It's it's like the map of your of your lot in in your home, where where you live, and and so your lot has a, a boundary around it, and those boundaries are all irregular, like a map, and so the map of the brain has these Broadman areas named after Corbinian Broadman from the turn of the century, early 1900s, and um, Corbinian Broadman mapped all these different parts of the brain and their function, and he was able to figure out what areas did certain things and what they were responsible for. And so we carry that today with these numbers, these Broadman area numbers, like Broadman area seven and Broadman area six. These are areas of, of, um, of cortex of the brain, both surface and deep. So to review, we can, we can have brain waves that are EEGs. We can do quantitative EEGs of the surface, and then we can do quantitative EEGs that are of the deep brain also. And those are called S. Loretta. And S. Loretta stands for uh, low resolution tomography. And they call it low resolution, even though it's quite high resolution at five by five by five millimeters, uh, because it's compared to functional MRIs. And functional MRIs and other research tools are much more expensive and involve um, you know, large pieces of equipment that are not portable and that are very expensive and that are basically not available to people, where QEGs are available and portable these days. In fact, um, since they became portable, I became very excited because I could carry them around and take them from office to office and use them even in sports fields and, and all kinds of places, um, family homes, house calls, I mean, office, office visits. There's so much diversity you can do with this technology. So in the end, what you get is you get um, uh, the original brain waves, which are squiggles, you get surface maps and you get deep maps of all of the top of the brain, uh, basically the, the top above something called the tentorium, which is the, the next layer that holds most of the brain up for you and separates the brain that we call the cerebrum from the cerebellum below. We can't read the cerebellum with QEEG. We cannot read the brainstem either. We can only read the, um, the, the, what are called the giant pyramidal cells because these giant pyramidal cells make an electrical signal that we can pick up. But there are other parts of the brain that don't make a signal that we can pick up. And so we can't pick those up with this technology. So um, we need more advanced things like SPECT, or, um, which is a CT scan of the brain. And, and you can do that for the brain, for the heart, for, you can do it for bones. But that's a CT scan, a computed tomography. That's an X-ray scan, and that's a scan that um, um, that that is more detailed, and, and of course more radiation because there's no radiation with QEG, and there is um, no electricity even going into the patient with QEG. There's no electrical current going into the patient whatsoever. It only picks up what's coming out, so it's completely safe, um, and. Um, and since the patient is not looking at anything uh, with their eyes open or closed that is moving or flashing lights, there's no risk for a seizure when they're doing a QEG either. So, um, so the QEG gives us these beautiful maps. They, they give us statistical analyses through Z-scores of what is uh, normative and what is re reference data so that we can, we can compare you at rest because you're at rest with your eyes open for, for 10 minutes and eyes closed for 10 minutes. And we're measuring the brain at idle. So the brain is measured at idle, doing nothing. And we're trying to see what does your brain, how efficient is your brain at idling? It's just like a mechanic when they listen to your car at idle, they turn the car on and they listen for a rough engine. And if they hear a rough engine, they say, ah, I better do something about it. There's no performance going on. There's no, there's no revving, there's no turning, there's no actions happening in the car, it's just running. And so that listening to the car's engine at idle is very analogous to what we do with QEG. Now there's certainly other tests that can be done where the brain is doing something, 
it's not at rest, and those are other tests, and we can go into those at another, another time, and we certainly will. Um, they have other names and other processes, but this is the gold standard for really measuring how healthy a brain is at rest in, um, in the holistic ways. And there's so much literature on QEG and so many conditions from ADD and ADHD to, um, to PTSD and traumatic brain injuries, mild traumatic brain injuries. Uh, this technology is very helpful in depression and anxiety. It's helpful in uh, stroke. It's helpful in um, dementias and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So this technology is extremely useful, but it is not considered diagnostic by itself any more than a stethoscope is diagnostic by itself. It's in the hands of a doctor that it's made into a diagnostic helpful tool. It's not a, it's not a diagnosis by itself. So you can't get a diagnosis from a QEG by itself. You can use it to aid in the process of figuring out what's going on with a person. But it is a very holistic, very beautiful way, I think, of, of examining the functional processes of the brain. And it allows us to assess more than just for neurofeedback. It was a tool that was invented really in parallel with neurofeedback, which is a therapy where you train the brain's waves to get closer to normal. Now, um, that'll be my next video. However, QEG will show you not only what you might consider to do as a treatment plan for um, neurofeedback to, to maybe take alpha waves down in one region or beta waves up in another region and, and in, increase their amplitude or, or whatever, um, that kind of thing is, is very useful. But QEGs can also give us insights into lower brainstem um, concussions because they pick up artifacts. They pick up movements around the eyes and, and fluttering when people's eyes are closed. Sometimes they, they flutter like that after, after a trauma. Uh, it will pick up um, movements of the scalp that have to do with temporomandibular joint disorders and muscular problems of the temporalis muscle um, and uh, the occipitalis muscle and the frontalis muscle and these, mu these eye muscles around the eyes. It will also pick up rolling, slow rolling eye movements. Slow rolling eye movements are something that patients are not usually aware of that happen in, in sleep deprivation and sleep disorders, and they can happen in concussion. Uh, they can happen with certain medications. There's all kinds of things that can happen. And so even though we're not directly measuring brain waves, we're measuring artifacts that are very telling, very useful. And these artifacts show us what's happening in the lower brain indirectly, and they show us what's happening in the person's metabolism or even their sleep. And they might guide us to say, to, to perhaps order a, um, a sleep study, which is a, which is a neurological specialty done by a, a sleep fellow that's done a fellowship in sleep disorders, which I have not. And they would go to a laboratory and do an EEG under sleep um, and sleep the night and, and get a proper EEG that way. Very, very useful. And that's a gold standard for sleep disorder diagnosis. So um, QEG creates these maps that are many pages long. They are circles that show surface and um, three-dimensional images that show deep brain functions. In some cases, you can use software and turn them around and, and look at them and see them in 3D. Uh, and, uh, and it's very, very useful. So there's just a hundred, over a hundred pages of, of information that comes out. And um, uh, that's one of my favorite non-invasive methods of assessing the brain. We're looking forward to your questions and want to answer them. Thank you very much. <laughs>